Uh, hello, friends. Welcome uh, to another episode of Exploring Mental Illness, Everything You Wanted to Know But Were Afraid to Ask. I'm Derek Mulhan, along with uh, Carrie Ballou and Austin Ricketts. How are you folks doing today? Doing great today. How are you doing? Um, yeah, I missed I missed the last one, so I'm trying to catch up on this, this part two with uh, Dan Fisher and um, Dale Silvaria, is it? Uh, September was a horrible month for me, and i um, not going to... Not going to sugarcoat it. What happened was one of my meds was back-ordered. They didn't tell me. I had an eight-day supply left. They were back-ordered for almost four weeks. So I went from 300 milligrams to 150. I figured having 16 days would be better than eight days. I was a mess. I was an absolute mess. I seriously contemplated suicide for the third time in my life. It was... I had to have people tell me that I had the strength that I thought I had, that I still had. They had to remind me, you know, the the light is at the end of the tunnel. My therapists were very upset. They finally figured out a way to get me a 14-day emergency supply of the med that I needed. But then it took an, an additional six weeks to get that in. So I'm pretty much, I'm like at 99%. You know, I started a new job in September. I only missed one day of work there because I was just so afraid to go out. The only residual side effects that I'm having now, just afraid to sleep at night with my thoughts. And I'm researching this drug, and I realized it's not a very good drug to be on for the simple fact of the side effects and the withdrawal symptoms. Withdrawal symptoms start within 14 hours of you not taking it. So you have to take it on a consistent basis. Um, so that's, that's why I wasn't here. I had written you guys a letter. Um, to read on the air, but um, I guess, yeah, it was probably better coming from me. Listen, I've been dealing with this for so long, and that was the worst I had felt in years, and I hated it, and I had people backing me up, and I have to say Emma Carroll, who was one of our guests, um, really reached out because I was posting some stuff on Facebook, and she reached out. I pretty much can say she saved my life because I was on that edge, and I hadn't felt like that you know, in years. I mean, I'm a suicide uh, attempt survivor, and I said I would never do that again. And I had to keep telling myself that um, because the meds weren't there, the anxiety, the depression, everything was lying to me. But it was tough. My emotions, I couldn't keep them. I was crying. You know, I felt bipolar, but I wasn't. So to the listeners out there, not just in case of an emergency of a, a hurricane or an earthquake or something like that, Always make sure you have a backup plan. This has never happened to me where I did not have my meds. And no one should ever have to go through that hell or have to suffer. If not for my therapist, I don't even know if I'd be here today. But dealing with this for so long, I made it through. I made it through with some life lessons. I learned more. I learned more that you need to do yourself due diligence by checking out the meds that you are on. Sometimes they're not the best ones for you. I I did my own research on this med. Every doctor offered it as a last result for the simple fact because of the side effects and the withdrawal symptoms. You can't go from a full dose to a half a dose. You have to wean, especially off, and you're supposed to wean 10 milligrams at a time on this off this bed. So I apologize for not being here. I just didn't think it was going to do anybody due diligence. I still challenged myself when I was at those rough times. Unfortunately, I was trying to start a relationship with somebody, and I became very insecure and I blew that right out the window, too. Um, on the positive side, last week, I drove on the highway eight miles for the first time by myself in over 14 years. So I got right back on the horse and challenged myself. I'm working for Providence College Athletics now. I'm filming all their events uh, in the sports spectrum. And I was just like, you know, I, I take North Main Street, for anybody who knows North Main Street, to Admiral Street. And I was just like, man, I just don't feel like I just don't feel like driving through the city tonight. And without any hesitation, I just hopped on the highway. I hadn't driven on the highway by myself in over 14 years because of my anxiety of the highway. And eight miles may not sound like a lot, but it was it was it was a long way. But anxious, yes. Afraid, no. So I checked that one off, and um, that's that's my story. And I'm and like I said, I'm not afraid to share it. I mean. Everybody goes through bumps, highs, and lows. This was a, a major pothole, but I always had to keep my eyes on the prize. It, it was I was just some meds away. So, like I said, I'm like 99.9%. I've got what I like to call um, panic hangover, anxiety, or depression hangover. You know, you, you're tired because you fight so hard. So um, I'm glad to be back. 
So uh, I don't, this isn't all about me, but I figure everybody deserves to know why I wasn't here. And I think everybody can learn from this, that no matter how down you get, lean on your friends. Emma Carroll was a former guest here, um, and she reached out. She was the first one to reach out. And I used people from my past who still are friends as resources. Was I this bad? Yeah, you were, you were, you were worse. So don't, don't worry about this. So um, that's, uh, that's my story. And um, just like I said, glad to be back. Well, we are very happy to have you back, and thank you for sharing. I think that for our listeners out there, it's important to both hear um, hear from us about different services and information regarding um, mental illness, but I feel like it's probably a little even more impactful to hear about your actual experiences that you are personally going through in your journey. It kind of shows it, that it's something you have to work on every day. And it's, it's a battle every day. I mean, you can have great days. I mean, I have great days, but it doesn't mean I'm still not battling every day. But you can live a good life and battle at the same time. It's just a matter of winning those battles. You know, you might lose a battle, but you're going to win the war. Like I said, 25 years, and I think the listeners need to know that they've heard me on this, you know, speak about, I mean, this was almost, you know, ground zero. But you can't give up. And we always say you're not alone. And if I was alone, I wouldn't be here. I guarantee that. But the people who reached out to me and the people who I use as my resources, get back to your normal breathing, get back to your, you know, this, that, and the other. They had to remind me, you're strong. You haven't lost the strength. You just got to find it again. And, that, and that's what happened. But it was, it, was, it, was, it was complete hell. And like I said, no one should have to go through that. Folks, take care of your meds. Make sure that you have a backup plan and do some diligence, you know, when, when you're in the right state of mind to see if... Just because the med's working doesn't mean it's the best one for you. And, of course, always remember one day at a time. That's right? You know what? That's it. You know, I, I know I'm here today. I'll be working tonight. You know, I, I have a job now where I'm very excited, you know, to work at. So, um, but you know what? Um, I appreciate Austin, you know, yeah. filling in. Austin reached out, um, and I appreciate that. And... Um, yeah, there's nothing to apologize for for not, you know, being here last episode. And it does seem like you've kind of recovered. And that's awesome that you were able to make such a, you know, well, turnaround. I mean, I mean, you, you saw me when I was really bad. You know, a lot of stuff had come down. And, um, you know, I thought my, you know, my doggy came down with pancreatic cancer. And, um, you know, I don't know how long he's got. And just so much, so much stuff came down on me. And at the, 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 Worst time it could have come down, but I'm here, and um, you know that's that's enough of that. So why don't uh, I'm I'm just playing catch up here for this for this part two. So Carrie, if you want to introduce our, our guests uh, from last time, that would be great. Let me compose myself here a little bit. Thank you, Derek. Um, so for our listeners, this is part two of our episode talking with uh, folks from D- the Department of Mental Health, or DMH, uh, here in Massachusetts. So we'd like to welcome back uh, Dan Fisher, who is the Taunton Attleboro Site Director for DMH in the state of Massachusetts, and, and uh, Dale Silvaria, who is a Community Integration Specialist, also here in the Commonwealth. Welcome back, guys. Wow. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks. We're happy to have you. Where to pick up? We had talked about so much in our last episode that we felt like it was absolutely a benefit to have you both back here. If you wouldn't mind kind of giving our listeners who maybe haven't heard the last episode or it's been a while, just an overview about what DMH does. And then maybe we could transition into some of the um the different services you guys offer, they were noted a lot in episode one to our audience. We talked about a lot of different resources that DMH offers, as well as some of the history. But um, Dan and Dale are going to take some time and maybe dive a little deeper into what's offered. Sure. Um, first of all, just appreciate Derek for sharing with us. And, uh, you know, I think it's uh, always a message of hope to other folks who are sharing your journey with you. And, and speaking of journeys, um, eight miles in, in Rhode Island is like half the state, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, just, just about. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, um, the Department of Mental Health, um, right out of its mission statement, is that it's the state mental health authority, and it assures and provides access to service and supports to meet the mental health needs of individuals of all ages, enabling them to live, 
work and participate in their communities. It's very important that our goal is to have people live productively in their own communities. We recognize that mental health is an essential part of our health care, and the department establishes standards to ensure effective and culturally competent care and to promote recovery. So the department sets the policies, it promotes self-determination, it protects human rights, and supports mental health training and research. This critical mission is accomplished by working in partnership with other state agencies, individuals, families, providers, and communities. And the vision of the department of their care is to provide an essential part of the health care to individuals in the state of Massachusetts. Great. I've never heard the DMH mission statement before. It's right on the website. If anybody wants to go to mass.gov backslash DMH, you'll find it right there. I think within the context of what we've been talking about, though, is that we're talking about what the local services are, which are a reflection of the work that the department does. Essentially, most sites will provide the same range of services. They may have uh, strength in one or the other, more numbers than in others, but this is kind of a presentation of what we do overall. Um, And in speaking about the Taunton Attleboro site itself, I think it's important to note uh, for our our listeners here that it is throughout the Taunton and Attleboro areas, including Mansfield and Middleborough, Lakeville. It has Dighton, Rehoboth, and... uh, Seekonk. Seekonk. Thank you very much. We always forget Seekonk. Poor Seekonk's on the edge. (laughs) Don't be offended, Seekonk. We're all here for you. So just to give a little overview, and and then we can speak in more detail, because uh, we put together what we offer at the Taunton Attleboro site. And so it's consistent with DMH Community First Initiative, and, and that's a very important initiative of the department. We want to serve people first in their local communities. The idea of the Department of Mental Health serving people in grand institutions or someplace other than their home is not at all accurate. We strive to reach people in their own homes or in their own living conditions and that we have a stress in the community first. And we work to promote recovery and resiliency in each individual we serve and to increase his or her capacity for independent living in the community. Um, The site promotes and provides services which are uh, promoting human dignity, humane and adequate care, and self-determination and freedom of choice. And we recognize that sometimes freedom of choice requires us as providers of service to acknowledge that some choices are perhaps not what we would make, um, and that there's sometimes a quality of risk to those. However, as long as it's not violating or compromising a person's individual safety or the safety of others, we support people in living their lives as best they can where they are and with the resources they have before them. And that follows the initiative of the department as a whole statewide to provide services that are person-centered. What is it that you want? What do services look like for you in your life, in your community? So they direct what services they want and how that looks for them, and they direct their goals. You know, one of the things that I appreciate about the person-centered model is the fact that the description of it itself truly does hold true to its name. And I've, I've heard the model um, used, and it is used throughout very different capacities in healthcare and in uh, human services. When you say person-centered, do some people, I mean, do they have no clue what they want? or how they want, and is that where you guys come in to help them, you know, maybe guide them on a path? Absolutely. You know, we might use the term person-centered when we're talking maybe to an applicant, but then we're going to talk about what does that mean and how can how do you interpret that. And then when we talk about the application process, this is usually when it will come up. And if they say they don't know what they need, we'll talk about, well, What are your challenges? What are your goals? And what are the barriers to reaching those goals? Oh, I think this service might be of help to you. Let me explain the service to you. Is this something you might like to explore? Person-centered, you know, we talk about it. Is this after they've seen a doctor? No, they don't have. Or before, or doesn't matter? No, you can put in an application at any time. You feel like you may want to talk to somebody from the department, which in the Taunton Attleboro area is typically me or somebody on my team. And so you'll make your application, 
and it will go through the first stage, which is to make sure you have a qualifying clinical diagnosis that meets the criteria. And then from there, if you are in the Taunton out of area, it comes down to us. And we sit, hopefully, at a place where you feel comfortable, your home, a coffee shop, the library. And we sit down and have a conversation about who you are and what kind of supports do you feel you need in your life from the department. It almost sounds like a, I don't it sounds weird, a reverse um reverse sales almost because so instead of you know someone coming in and you're like hey would you like this hey would you like that hey let me tell you everything that we offer you're first listening to what their needs are and then you're kind of in the back of your head like oh they may benefit from this product or that product or that service yes it can be very confusing if you start off with somebody telling them all the services we have and overwhelming and overwhelming (laughs) to everybody so it's, it's much easier anyway in the way that we practice here at our site office to first get a sense of who you are and what you might need and, again, trying to match that up to try to pare it down. I think it's also important to recognize that this is an evolution of the department. We certainly have been through a time in which the experts, um, their doctors or their therapists or their case manager at the Department of Mental Health, you know, presented themselves as here are your options, pick one or you have to do this or the other. Being person-centered isn't just a technique. It's, It's an attitude. It's a presentation. It's a cultural shift. And what we are encouraging our staff and our partners in the community is to really engage people in a conversation that elicits from them their preferences And even to the point that what we're instructed to do in case management is to write the goals in the person's own words, not in statements that says, Johnny needs this. What is it that Johnny would like to accomplish? And we write down Johnny's words that say, this is what I want to accomplish. And then it's our responsibility to help them meet those goals as best we can. I think the best part about this from what I'm hearing is so many people have white coat syndrome. You're meeting them. It's it's almost like a mental illness blind date because you're going to a coffee shop. You're going to where they feel comfortable. They're going to open up more. I, I would imagine, obviously, in you know, instead of just all right, you're going to go to this hospital. It's you know, like I said, white coat syndrome, intimidating. They might get freaked out, think they have a real problem. Um, I know my therapist. He'll meet me at his office. We'll we can meet in the park. And he does the same thing. It's like, where, where do you want to be at? Well, I want to be. I want to better myself. Well, how do you want to better yourself? He makes me find the answers. Sure. A lot of other people just here you go. Here's your syllabus on how to get better. Just do it. But I had to find every road that I went down. He just didn't tell me. And if I had a bad day, he wanted to see me on my good days and my bad days and my horrible days. But he would always say, okay. What do we learn from this? Where do we go from here? And I had to find those. I always tell Carrie, you know, on the commercials, we're done a big disservice by seeing the the happy A Abilify guy come out and say, hey, guess what? Take this. Everything's going to be great. There's no work needed. But I love the fact that you'll meet them on their own terms, and I would imagine that that helps immensely. I would hope so, because we really recognize the fact that you might be meeting myself or somebody from my team to meet you for the first time to talk about some very personal and sensitive issues for you. And we want to be respectful of that and respectful that you may not meet us again. You know, we most likely will be referring you to um, one of the other services that we provide that we'll talk about in a little bit, um, and then continue that person-centered work. Continue moving forward in a way that you direct. And it's interesting, uh, Derek, to hear you talk about your experiences and how you relate that to being person-centered. I had mentioned I've heard person-centered on on many different occasions and many different points in my life, in my career, but I was unaware of the concept of motivational interviewing until I started working at, at Fuller. And so, of course, you know, I go on the units. I have relationships with our case management team and our discharge planners. And I, I kind of observe. And that's when I started picking up on motivational interviewing. And that's a technique in which really does emphasize the person-centered model where you are asking the appropriate questions to identify and help the individual identify 
really what their needs are. They may not really have an idea, but if you strategically ask the right questions and they come to that conclusion on their own, they're more likely to then stick to a plan, stick to a regime, try a treatment if it's something that they had kind of come to the conclusion and accepted themselves would be a benefit. Well, and the and the other thing is, you know, the the conception of going to a mental health care facility. You're crazy. You're nuts. I think, like I said, meeting at a coffee shop or meeting somewhere, you want to break that stigma. That's why I'm here, trying to break the stigmas. But like I said, being able to meet somewhere, they're going to probably they're going to open up and share more. They're not going to be as intimidated. They're probably not going to cancel. When I first went to the hospital, it was scary, you know, and the hospital, I was a frequent flyer. The hospital used to be a safe place for me because I knew I wasn't going to die there. And now I hate going to the hospital because now I know something's actually wrong. It's not my panic or anxiety. Now I know if I go to the hospital, something is actually wrong. And the other thing I I wanted to, um, you both said dignity. Dignity is extremely huge because I remember going, this will stick with me till the day I die. I remember going in the second time for an anxiety attack. And I heard the doctor say, this kid is just looking for attention. Give him a pill, send him home. I thought that was insulting, and I and I had the diagnosis. They could have said, "Yeah, you know, it was an anxiety attack. He has an Ativan. We're going to send you home." It's but he just said he's just looking for attention. That was that was. I mean, I felt like the lowest, you know, the lowest on on the planet, you know, doing that. I have a I have a confirmed diagnosis, and here's this jerk saying, "Oh, well, he's just looking for attention. Send him home." And I think you know what Dan said that this is an evolution. You know, and it comes from the department wanting to know how people respond to the work that we do. So we pay attention to that. We evolve our practices around that. And hopefully that will never happen to you when you're working with somebody from the department. You both have decades of experience between you. Um, has not this, that old. <laughs> <laughs> has this model been in place since you've been working uh, in, in, the, in this industry, or have you seen it kind of changed over time? What I would say about that, and I've been doing this uh, for 25 years, started out as a case manager, then I went into case managing children, I was case managing adults, and then from there became a supervisor and worked at our crisis unit. Now I'm the site director. I think that if you were to ask the average case manager in any moment, they would say they always approach things this way. Institutions sometimes are a little bit behind the curb of where their workers are. I think we all can experience that because we had sensitive, knowledgeable case managers. And we'll talk a little bit more about case management. Um, The crux of this being a situation, like I was saying, of moving from just a technique and a cure for people Um, really has has evolved lately across the board, across the spectrum of of our care. And I think the department is now articulating what a lot of the grassroots or in the trenches people always want. As a matter of fact, our plan is called an individual service plan. So we always tried to be individual, but What does individual mean? Does it me telling you what you'll get individually, or is it you telling me what you need? And again, it's the shift in the posture um, of the the conversation. For example, as you pointed out, motivational interviewing is to make sure you make the strategic question, but not expecting your answer to come out of the person you're talking to. You're there to encourage, through the interview process, that person bringing forth what's inside them, not anticipating the answer that you want them to have. Yes, doctor, I'll take that medication, because we are thinking that the doctor, the expert, wants us to take that medication. It really has to be a dialogue about, is this the right medication? Is it got the side effects it's going to be? What am I going to live in this? And is the benefit going to outweigh the expense to me as a person in living a life that's full? Um, That's a dialogue, and it changes the posture of of the relationship. Talking about, um, you know, DMH and the services that you guys provide, uh, which really does allow and helps individuals, adolescents, adults, um, and seniors to kind of gain their own individualized need journey um, plan for recovery. I mean, I look I look at 
mental illness as something that is um, in the same boat as an uh, as an addiction or another chronic disorder that someone may have or a chronic need that it's it's recovery it's relapse prevention that's truly what it is it's one day at a time there's no magic pill or cure so what are some of these services that an individual could benefit from after you've had this dialogue and got an idea? Well, I think that um, just to kind of go off on what you said a little bit was uh, in our brochure for the site office, we give a list and we can send this to anyone who might want it. And our list of services can be found on the, the mass.gov uh, backsplash DMH website. Um, but one of the things that we, we approach in what you just said was that um, mental illnesses are real. They're recognizable and treatable. Resiliency is the hallmark of recovery, and recovery is real. And I personally always take the idea of recovery and the idea of resiliency together because we can have recovery, but for us, recovery doesn't mean you're cured. You're often on the races. You can be doing well and then at times you're not doing well. And it's our resiliency that can push forward our recovery. And it's important, I think, for people to understand that. So just backtracking a little bit, as Derek had asked about, our referrals, for the most part, will come from a psychiatrist or a therapist or an inpatient hospital. Sometimes they are, are, are self-elicited, but for the most part, they're coming from some service provider who feels that the person could use more assistance. And as I pointed out last time we talked, the vast majority of folks who have mental illness or challenge don't ever come to the department because they're able to live a, a, in a meaningful way in the community without those supports. And for the most part, we're getting referrals from folks who really aren't able to live functionally in the department. Well, I'm sorry, without the department. And it's actually one of the criteria that we use to determine somebody's appropriate for DMH services that they haven't functioned well for a while and, are, and we're anticipating that they won't be able to function well in the community on their own or with supports unless we're there. So we do offer a variety of supports and I'll just kind of list them and then Dale and I can talk about them individually so that we kind of keep them straight. So if you come to the Department of Mental Health, make an application, and you've been found to have met the clinical criteria, which means you have a substantial mental health concern, um, and from that it comes down to the site, and we've determined that we have something we can offer that nobody else is offering, and that you had a need for that. And that all comes out of our conversation with the person. So what is your needs? We can supply that needs. Here they are. And we supply the needs using various programs and service types. So I'll just list the, we first have our DMH case manager, who is a, a state of the Department of Mental Health um, employee. Um, and then the department vendors out or enters into a contract with other agencies to provide other specific services for us. The first uh, is our Adult Community Clinical Services Program. We'll talk more about that. The Program for Assertive Community Services. The Clubhouse Services, which we talked a lot more about last time. Recovery Learning Communities. And we also have an emergency service that's not state-run, but it's provided for us, and we make resource to that for people who are in need. We do have some homeless services that are contracted. The Department of Mental Health does not offer homeless services directly in this area, nor are we a housing agency, but as Dell has said before, housing is one of the major concerns people come with. So we try our best, and we have um, joined our resources with um, agencies in the community that do homeless um, services for the um, people in the community. And then we have a few, very few uh, specialized programs for individuals who have um, what we might call a high-end need, who need a great deal of structure, and, and those are very specialized and unique to each individual. So I think maybe I could turn to Dale and ask her if she could talk about case management. Uh, Dale is the case management supervisor as well as the three or four hundred other things she does for the site. So maybe she could uh, talk to us a little bit about that. So at the site office, we have uh, several folks who provide case management services. So again, as Dan said, it looks different for every person who's utilizing the surface. So we want to be creative. 
and we want to specialize um, the service to what works best for you. This might include helping you apply for MassHealth if you don't have insurance. It would include helping you apply for food stamps if you needed to. It would help you maybe if you felt like you wanted to apply for benefits such as Social Security or disability. You may need referrals to a therapist or a psychiatrist or a dentist, any kind of doctor or, or medical provider. We will help you make that referral and even maybe take you the first few times if you need support with that until we can arrange for you to have transportation provided to you. We may um, help you with budgeting if that's something that you struggle with. We want to link you with as many natural supports in your community as possible and help you become more independent in utilizing those supports. Because what my thinking is around our services is we have done our job when you do not need us anymore, whether it's case management or any other service, because every service's goal is to get the person that we are serving out there on their own, understanding the system, comfortable around you know, following through with their own needs and knowing how to do that and then you don't need us anymore, and that's a huge success. So it just includes so many different things that are individualized to everybody, but it's primarily to help you become independent and make sure all of your needs are met. And with that, they would begin with us doing a comprehensive assessment of the person, which again is uh, trying to do it from the I-thou relationship, you know, in which we're asking you what your goals and needs are. And that is followed up with an individual service plan, which then directs the case manager and what that individual's needs and wants are. So when you meet with them, your individual service plan should always be on both our minds. What is the case manager there for? What is the individual we're serving there for? So that we make those goals. And those I as individual service plans may direct us then into another service. Um, the other services that we have, um, the Adult Community Clinical Service Program is brand new to us. We used to have a community-based flexible support system that or service that some people may be aware of or participated in. And the, the importance of the shift, and again, I think um, as we've talked about motivational interviewing or the department's own expression of what it is and what it can be to others is really shifting by the words we use and the terms we use, the titles we have for programs to acknowledge that this is a service that is, first of all, clinically based and based in the community. It's not drawing people into clinics. It's serving um, individuals in their own homes. And that can be provided in various different environments. Um, we do have what we call group living environments. They're very few, and there's always a wait list for them. And one of the reasons why we just don't promote that is that we feel that community living environments are really for those folks who really need a great deal of support who haven't demonstrated that they can function or have functioned well in the community without those supports. But if we go back to the mission of the department, we want to serve people in the community where they live and in the, in the least restrictive environment, the most natural environment. So the rest of that program serves a great many more people in their own apartments or with their parents or in an, in an environment that they may have shared living with other people in the community. And part of that, again, is that they'll do an assessment with the person of what they need, and then they will begin a plan in which they meet their goals. And unlike the individual service plan the case manager has, the program will have much more detailed um, plan for that individual and have a much more detailed understanding of what the clinical needs are. I think it's important to note, though, that we wouldn't call it a treatment program. Um, uh, our residential programs, so to speak, are not treatment programs like you might uh, see like at an ad care or at the full or partial type of thing in which somebody goes there and, and gets treatment. But this is to bring into the natural environment of an individual a clinical astuteness of how to help this person manage their symptoms, function well in the community, and make use of all of their supports in a, in a natural environment that suits them and meets their needs. It's the largest service that we offer in that we have much more people in it. We have about 238 folks directly involved in that. And um, that goal is, again, as Dale has said, even with case management, 
Our goal is that you don't need that level of care or service anymore and that you move through that level of service into a more natural and environment, um, natural care with natural supports. That's big about the individuality because whenever I had like really bad panic attacks, I would start avoiding places. And as much hell as I've gone through, like I've been in my, my same apartment for 19 years because the rent is great. You know, it's, it's a great little place. It's, it's, it's all that I really need. But I didn't like being there because of the past. And the thing was, if I had avoided all the places that I had panic attacks, I would still wind up in my apartment <laughs> anyway. Your individualization, you know, getting them comfortable being on their own, they're not going to be afraid to be in their house if they've had, you know, problems at the house. They're going to be more comfortable, you know, in those situations. Is that basically what I'm getting from what you guys are talking about also? That's definitely part of it. We, we want to um, support you in, in a very global way. Again, as Dan said, you're going to have an individual service plan or an individual action plan that is going to have your goals. If that's one of your goals, then whether it be case management or the program for sort of community services or ACCS, whichever program you have, you're going to join together with your support person to figure out how best you can work through that. So then if somebody's not around, you'll be able to do it on your own. I think it's important uh, for folks to, who, their listeners to know that the ISP or the Individual Service Plan is something that is in place not just to sit on a shelf or in a computer until next year when you open it or up and update it or next quarter or the next time that you meet with your case manager or the service or program that you have. It's something that truly the best way to benefit from an ISP and from that program and that service plan is to know the content, to understand it, to have open dialogue about that content and to, for it to be a constant guide on this journey of what it is that you need, where you've been. So in my previous life, I wrote a lot of ISPs. And, you know, in some cases, depending where you're at, more often than not, the individuals I work with did not reference, couldn't even tell you where, how, what, or anything about their ISP. It was just something they knew from a meeting they had once in a while. And so it was. it's nice to hear you, Dan, talk about, and Dale, talk about the importance of the ISP, or the Individual Service Plan, but also about how key it is to your treatment. And it also can help you keep focused. You know, sometimes we get overwhelmed with all of the goals that we have in our lives in general. We're just doing a little bit on each and forgetting about where did we really need to start. So using your ISP as a guide, as a reference, reminds you. And then when you meet with your case manager or whoever your support person is, you might talk about, well, what steps did you want to take for the next two weeks or the next week or the next month that will help you get closer to meeting the school? And then the next time you meet, you might check in on how did that go? And you can change your plan at any time. You can add, you can, I accomplished this goal. I feel really good. Now I'm ready to work on this goal. It's not something that's just going to remain stagnant for the year, like you said, Carrie. You know, you can change it anytime you want. And as you progress, I reached this goal, now I want to try this one. But the key to keeping it alive is that you, the individual whose planet it is for, are actually using it. Using it and working on it. That's what I've gone through. I mean, I take every step. You know, September was kind of a lost month, and I felt I'm behind. I'm behind a month. And my therapist said, all right, you may feel that way, but you're not. You know, just take things. What do you think you're behind on? Why do you think you're overwhelmed? Write it down on a piece of paper. This is what you can control. This is what you can't control. Um, and my steps have been, I wanted to drive down to the Cape to see my, my stepfather on Father's Day. I did that. It took me 14 years for the, you know to drive down to the Cape. And then I said, you know what? I think I'm in a good position to start dating again, which I've started doing. And then the other night it was, you know what? Tonight's the night. I, I need to drive on the highway now. So each step for me is I just want to keep bettering myself. And I go to my therapist and I'll say, I want to better myself. Well, how do you want to better yourself? Well, this is, this is what I want to do. I know that when I see him next week, he's going to say eight miles is great. And now I want you to do that for 10 miles. Go a couple of extra miles and then start, you know, start doing it on a consistent basis. Exactly. That would be the spirit. 
that would definitely be the spirit of what the plan would be for anybody who's working on a plan. If you don't want to better yourself and you're in a position, at least for me, if you're in a position of complacency, I don't think you're going to get better. I don't think you're going to get worse. Obviously, you're not going to get better. I mean, some people are complacent and they're they're happy where they are. I'm not that type of person because I feel like I missed out on 20 years of my life battling this. But better late than never. Now I want to be better at things yesterday, but I've got to one day at a time, one step at a time. And that, that driving on the highway was just spur of the moment. But that's how things are coming to me now. It's just like, What's the worst that's going to happen? I made sure that where I hopped on the highway, there was an exit within four or 500 yards if I started getting anxious. And I didn't. I, I just wanted to get home to watch the ball game. <laughs> I didn't feel like driving through the city. And I was just like, I had no thought about it. And it was, and it was really weird because I was just like, holy cow, I'm on the highway. I think what one of the aspects of the services that we offer in the um, adult community clinical service particularly has peer supports. Those are people who share their relationships um, and struggles with their own mental health. And um, what they're able to do, and, and they're all certified in this, is sharing their story and their successes. And as they say, nothing succeeds like success. And within that context, there's always hope. Um, and what I feel that the peers do is instill hope in others who are on the same journey with them to say that, you know, I did it, and this is how I did it, this is how I struggled, and this is where I was able to find an answer, and I'm still searching for answers. And by you sharing in this platform and the peers sharing in their platforms, it allows for folks to have that idea, well, maybe I can do it, and engaging in the supports and services that they have available to them brings about success. And I also will go back and say recovery is real, but it's that resiliency that will keep people with hope and in a a situation in which they can say, I'm having more successes and my recovery is real. So those are important aspects and it's important work to do as well. Well, that, you know what, that's why I'm here. I mean, I wear my heart on the sleeve. I mean, people say, you know, with this podcast that I've shared too much. Well, no, I was, I've been sick of lying about this. You know, I came out on Facebook six years ago now about my mental illness. and It was like the last monkey off my back. Because how many times could your car break down? How many times could you be sick when you're sick, but not in that way? Some people had known, they didn't know to the extent. I don't care how out there my life is, I will share every experience. If I can break the stigma, if I can help one person, then this podcast has been a success. And I know I've helped a couple of people because they, they've responded to me on Facebook. Hey, listen, I'm having some troubles. You know, I used to call people, you know, I used to call my mom in the middle of the night, have an anxiety attack. She's like, it's going to be fine. And now people call me in the middle of the night and say, hey, listen, I'm having a rough time. Okay, what do you need? What are you feeling? You know, I'm not a doctor, but, you know, I'm your friend. I can help you get through this. And it's sometimes I'm, I'm out on the road at 2 o'clock in the morning to go to somebody's house and just stay with them until they calm down because people did that for me. So not only is, you said nothing uh, succeeds like success, but then I think you need to pay it forward too. You need to share your experiences and pay that forward because if you can help somebody, then they're going to help somebody. And then maybe we can finally get over this, you know, this damn stigma that mental illness is something that needs to be kept private. I learn new things every day, and that's the best thing about this. You know, there are always new meds coming out. There's always new things. There's always new things to learn. Every year I go to the partial program at my hospital. I might not even need it, but it's a thing that I do yearly now just to keep myself abreast of the new programs that are out there that might help because you're never going to be, you know, a baseball player, a football player. They never reach the top of their game. They're always learning until they retire. I like that. Mental health refresher. Absolutely. You have to. And I think, Derek, that a lot of what you're talking about and the efforts that kind of your own self-coping skills and things that you've learned in your journey is a great example of how there are there's a significant amount of our population that has mental health diagnoses that range amongst themselves, but you can absolutely have and maintain a productive life in the community without the need necessarily of you know, a DMH level of care. But then there is the other side of the spectrum where we do have a lot of folks who absolutely would benefit from services such as the 
the ACCS or the what was the reference you had for the group? Group that, living environment. Group That's living environment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, and you then, have, but you have to start somewhere. I mean, I started out like that also. You know, and then I got to very similar to what you guys are doing. That's how I got to where I am today. And we have definitely, we see folks who receive a level of service from us for a while, and they are doing fabulously. And then some, they have a life event that just sets them back a little bit. And they'll call us up and say, I think I need some support again. Okay, come on in. Let's talk. Let's see what you might need. And it may be short term. And, you know, we don't know. But um, we are not going to shut the door on anybody because they had a setback. You know, that's what we're here for. You went out. You did great. You were two years. You didn't need us. Come back in. Let's talk and see what you need. I think it's ironic that you mentioned that because throughout this episode in particular, I've had in the back of my head on my orientation at Fuller, our education, primary education trainer. I remember like the first day within the first couple of hours, he comes in. The first thing he says to us orientees, and mind you, it's a whole whole slew of different folks with various backgrounds, mental health specialists, nurses, case managers, community relations, food services. And he said, his name's Wayne, he's like, every one of you is one life event away from being in those beds. And it was one of the ways that we really emphasized and wanted to make it clear to folks coming to work um, at Fuller that we treat others the way we want to be treated because we truly are only one life event away. That is absolutely true. That is absolutely true. So just to dive a little deeper into some of your services, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add on about group living or the the ACCS services. Sure. We, we have uh, also a program for assertive community services, which we call the PACT. Um, what's unique about this service is that it's a team that includes a doctor, a prescriber, a nurse, it has vocational expertise, it has peer supports, and they meet and work with people in their homes for the most part. And they come as a team. So strictly speaking, um, and ideally speaking, any one of the team might be working with you on various things or on the same thing. Um, We had one doctor who was engaged with a person, and the best way to engage that person was to wash dishes with them because as you're doing something in common, the barriers break down. You know, that's a great way of seeing it. Employment specialists are working with folks in order to find a job. A lot of folks, including the ACCS, work with people in finding employment. We work closely with Mass Rehabilitation Commission, um, MRC, um, to help find work. And so that's the specialty of assertive program service is, is to work with people as a team and to engage them in, in their care in the community in that way. For the most part, they're folks who perhaps don't engage well with uh, standard outpatient um, services. They may not engage well um, in a group living environment or with anyone else. And so it's really essential to these folks that we're working with them in the community where they're at and what they're able to tolerate as far as interventions. So that's um, that other service. We talked about clubhouse services the last time. Um, again, that's a, provided by the department, but anybody can go um, to the clubhouse to work uh, a work order day, they call it, and help find supports. And as long as you're coming within the context of your mental health concerns, we're open to working with uh, folks through the clubhouse system. We have one here in Attleboro, which will soon be moving to Taunton. Some of it is just logistics and real estate. Um, but there's also opportunities. I think if, as you go around Taunton, there's a lot more businesses than they, there are around here, as you can tell. So we're hoping that a new location will bring new life to it and engage people in more employment opportunities. Um, we have a, a recovery learning community. We don't have a local so-called office for them, but they come into the community and meet with folks, say, at the library or in an environment that is conducive to conversations as a group. Um, But really what the Recovery Learning Center is about is helping direct folks um, into natural supports in the community. They do offer some groups, but our encouragement is to see that as a resource in the community that connects people with resources in the community. And these are, are staffed by peers, most of whom are certified peer specialists. So they engage people in, in a dialogue about their own life experience so that when a person goes there, they're sharing and working with somebody who knows where they've been 
or has a great feeling and understanding of where they might be. And some people never have any um, contact with the department, but they may be in contact with recovery learning community. Um, and I think that for the most part is the standard menu of what we offer. But within that menu, you can add and subtract things all you want. So we are really in the context of trying to provide these services in a person-centered way or, or try to make those services work. What's interesting, I think, is that your, your services are very diverse and they really do help address the needs of individuals who are at various points along the mental health and dual diagnosis spectrum. You know, you mentioned the PAC team, right? Now, you know, the, that model itself, as we're talking about it, and I'm somewhat familiar with the PAC team, you know, uh, makes great sense. Here you've got this team of supports, medical, case management, clinical, that meet to help guide you, right, meet with the individual um, in their space, in their place, to give them the, the best um, quality of care that they can, they can provide. And I think that um, some folks may say, well, why don't we do that with everybody? Why isn't that offered to everybody? And I think maybe you guys can talk a little bit more about how there really are different levels of need and there are people that are in very different places on the spectrum that makes them eligible for receiving the services of a PAC team. Some folks will tell me I'm not comfortable having a whole team of people I, for whatever reasons they have. I would prefer to work with one person. Okay, mm-hmm. then let's start out with case management and see how that goes. And we'll, if then you feel like you need more, we can talk about that later. Um, some folks may have uh, difficulties leaving the house to get to their psychiatrist or uh, may need uh, more frequent access to their providers. So then that might be the PACT program. So yes, everybody is in a different space. Everybody's um, needs are different. So it's our job to figure out what services, uh, what supports they need, and then we can match them up. Not everybody needs that intensive level of care. Or you might start out with PACT, and then eventually, as you become more independent and you're learning new skills, you might then say, okay, I'm ready for just some case management, you know? And I think part of it, too, is that a PAC might be seen by some to be a more intense program. And part of that is because some of the folks we would um, refer would have criminal law enforcement um, backgrounds. May, you know, they may have had some forensic involvement, which may also make it difficult to engage as, uh, in individual services. Um, we have folks who are on a spectrum, so to speak, um, more chronically ill who need a team around them to really support them um, because their capacity to to live more productively without that support is limited. So they're, they're receiving that team to help them do that. And yet at the same time, we're talking about people who are encouraged to work and find work. But in order to do that, they need that kind of team around them. The clinical services that go with the Adult Community Clinical Service Program it's not that they're not in need of some services, but you know, there are folks who, for example, the PAC team, I'm not going to refer somebody to the PAC team who has a great relationship with the provider they already have, or who's engaged with the therapist for years, and that person's their real link to the community. The PAC won't do that because their team will take care of that. So a lot of times we're talking about folks who really have not engaged in what we call the classical outpatient component and environment um, in which you go to the appointment to see the doctor and you go to an appointment to see your therapist. They really engage them more more in a milieu than they would um, in the classical terms. So that's why somebody might be referred to the PACT rather than to um, the adult community services. So that, that makes the distinction. I've never directly worked with a PAC team um, for any one of anybody that I've been working with in my previous life working in mental health and, again, doing community relations at Fuller. I don't necessarily manage or have a, a client caseload. But my interpretation of the PAC team was, you know, like Dale said, the more significantly chronically mentally ill. And that's nice to hear. No, it's not just that, but that's one of the reasons why there's a PAC team in place. Because somebody could be not a danger to themselves, 
and be able to have some level of lucidity and are able to function in what they find to be deemed in a comfortable environment or, you know, or whether that be in an apartment or a homeless in a tent. They may be perfectly happy, whatever the case is. But there are folks that definitely require where you have to bring the services to them because otherwise it's been a trial and error. There are time with, um, with DMH or with getting services where maybe – it's known when they're taking their medication and when they're seeing somebody and when they have this and they have this, they're doing okay. But then once you kind of walk away or back away those services or put it in their hands to be proactive about it and they don't take their meds and they aren't pursuing that, they need a lot of handholding and support to get to that point. And really it's about extra support and guidance so that they stay on track so that they can stabilize. Right. We really want to support people around staying out of the hospital. I have not heard people say, I love being in the hospital. It's not, you know that you're in trouble typically when you're there. So PACT works with a lot of folks who are at very high risk of re-hospitalization and have a history of chronic re-hospitalization because for some reason they're just not able to maintain Um, whether it be taking their meds or seeing their providers, whatever the things are that they need to do to stay out of the hospital. So that would be perfect for a person like that. Absolutely. And from a facility and an inpatient perspective, we appreciate the PAC team because, granted, and and DMH and what your goal is, because we understand your goal is to be able to treat people in the community without having to necessarily, it's more preventative, without them having to get to a higher level of care if needed. But again, we're in recovery. We have ebbs and flows. This is chronic mental health issues. But it, it, from a facility perspective and an inpatient perspective, we, we want to see folks stabilize and, and leave us. And we, we want to not see them for a while, not never again, but to knowing that, that our, our work and our efforts have been able to transgress and follow them throughout. And uh, we also understand, I think, too, that the most... Um, healing and successful way to be stable is um, through the least restrictive of environments. We have folks, we do, we have folks who come through our hospital who are chronic mental health issues. They're fre- frequent flyers. I hate using that, but it's a, it's a term. And is it really the most therapeutic environment and is really their ideal place that they want to be if we're talking person-centered to be living in a hospital setting for long stretches of time or long stretches of time that are due to rehospitalization. You know, they're not really getting out there and adapting to their community and the community supports. So yes, we absolutely appreciate what the I, PAC team does. I think what you're pointing out is that this is this is no bed of roses. Um, our services are great, I think. I wish we had more. We talked about that before the podcast, that resources are always an issue. We'd like to provide more to those who need it, but we do prioritize those who need it the most. But it is an experience that we've had that it's challenging for a lot of people to engage us in services, even though they want it. I think that on one hand, we talk about folks who just are not aware that they're ill, And and Derek made a very good point. One of the reasons why we can be very successful in case management or the other services is that we make a connection with the person that the person can say, am I okay? Is this going all right? Because I don't feel okay. And I've had experience as a case manager myself where I've had to go up to someone and say, you know, can you hear me? Can you trust me? If I tell you that you're not doing well, Do you trust me enough to be able to accept that and look for the help that you need? Um, Some of my best um, work with folks have been in building a relationship with them in which they are able to trust me enough um, to be that connection to, quote unquote, to reality, who can say, you need need a little bit more help than than you're getting right now, and they're being able to uh, receive that help. And that's greatly... um, I feel that's a great success in what we've done. But the the other aspect of of this is not just because some folks may be too ill to accept our services or aren't aware of their own mental illness and we're trying to do what we can to engage them. And believe me, sometimes engagement can take weeks, months, years to really get to that point. But the other real difficulty we have in engaging folks are those who are duly diagnosed, those who are using 
um, street drugs and who are not inclined to ask for service because they don't want us to engage them or intrude on that connection that they have that's not healthy. Um, and it's um, much more difficult, as you know at Fuller, to try to help somebody who's, whose mental health concerns are obviously there, but they're also trying to withdraw from drugs or they're, they're eager to leave the hospital because they want to make that connection. I think that for the most part, if we were to look at those folks in our experience that are the most difficult to engage, it's those folks who are engaging in drugs and are not able to break that bound um, so that we can really engage them in services that are helpful for them. And with the opioid crisis very apparent throughout the country and the Commonwealth, um, we are seeing a significant increase in the individuals that we serve who have a dual diagnosis. Uh, I know I can speak for my hospital. We have dedicated units to treating individuals because then we can um, we can focus on the appropriate clinical aspect and clinical treatment. We cater the doctors, the programming, the education, the tools to dual diagnosis because it is a slippery slope. It's balancing um, treating two very chronic and distinct and aggressive conditions that could be aggressive conditions um, depending. So we have outpatient programs that are dedicated to it, but we have the capacity because we have to is to be able to, to, to detox somebody and to treat the, a dual diagnosis on every one of our units. Um, and that wasn't always the case. It wasn't. I'm sure, as we had talked about offline, having a podcast episode dedicated to dual diagnosis, but it wasn't like this 20, 30 years ago. Similar to um, how DMH has evolved, inpatient and community psychiatric hospitalization has to had to evolve to adapt to um, you know, addiction and mental health. So, you know, one of the things that I learned was the biggest thing is when you get the help that you need and then you realize, okay, I have to trust myself now. That's a big leap right there. You know, I used to call my mom four or five times a day, tell her about my anxiety. She said, I can't do this anymore. And she cut the cord or I was forced in times, you know, if I had an anxiety attack, I'd try to call somebody. They weren't home. It forced me to deal with it on my own. When you finally have gotten that help, trusting in yourself when you couldn't before is a major leap. And when you can get to that point, you know, even though I, I had my low times, I still went back, you know, check my blood sugar. Okay, my blood sugar is fine. You know, go back to my breathing. I, I go down a checklist now. Before I even think it's a panic or anxiety or depression, I go down my checklist because I have to trust in myself because if I can't trust in myself, I've learned nothing. And I think, you know, once you learn to trust yourself and you surround yourself with good enough people, then, you know, you're not always alone, but you do have to do it on your own at some point. You have to cut the cord and say, listen, I need to trust in myself. I have learned all this from A to Z. Let me check all this stuff off. And then if I'm not feeling right, well, then I'm going to call somebody and reference them, not bother them. Hey, is this what I felt like, you know, when, you know, back in the day? And if they say yes, okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Write that down and, you know, you can get back to it. But the, the peaks and valleys are always going to be there. And like I said, you have to trust in yourself. And if, you know, and if you don't, like, like I didn't, you, you reach out to people who, know your cause, know your what you've gone through, I have real friends who will say, yeah, or this doesn't sound right. Can That's an excellent that? point. Yeah, emphasizes the importance of self-care. A large part of WARA's coverage area includes Rhode Island. So I'm wondering if there's an analogous system in Rhode Island that uh, you refer people to or um, that people can maybe look up um, if they are in Rhode Island? I wish I could tell you more about Rhode Island. It is significantly different than in Massachusetts in that the um, health care authority doesn't reach as deeply into the community. What it does rely upon are local mental health centers um, to provide services to you uh, that are in a, in a way sponsored through that. Um, so I think within the context of those agencies, you make a referral to the local 
referral um, source, the agency itself, and then whatever benefit and services you would get would come through them. Whereas, in, as we said earlier, for the Department of Mental Health Services, you, you go through a, a centralized application process that then goes through a process of, di of, of confirming the diagnosis and sending it to locally. In Rhode Island, you start locally and then access services that might be needed for you there. For uh, any people in Rhode Island, would you happen to know uh, the best way, um, if they had a question, where could they go in Rhode Island? Is there a website or something? Yeah, ri.gov, ri and you can look up those resources through them. Great. Great. That being said, can you just let our, our listeners know, again, maybe a quick refresher on how they can apply, where they can apply, and more information about um, how they can contact the Totten Attleboro DMH site specifically. Okay, um, just within the context of, of the application itself, if you've got access to the web, um, it would be www.mass.gov backsplash DMH, and it will bring you to the DMH webpage, and you'll see at that webpage applications. You would are able to print those applications, and the most important part, as I said the last time of the application process, is the releases. The releases allow the area office to establish your clinical background and to determine whether or not uh, DMH services would be appropriate. If you're having trouble with that, the DMH information referral hotline is 1-800-221-0053. Again, that's 1-800-221-0053. If you want to contact the Taunton Attleboro site directly, for some crazy reason, I give everybody my telephone number, and that's 508-977-3150, 977-3150. And I will have to say, in my experience, the Department of Mental Health always answers its phone. Some people may have experienced other agencies that um, just ring or have a computer that answers the phone for you, but we answer the phone ourselves. If I can't help you, I'll direct you to somebody who can. Great. And for our listeners out there as well, the there are sites that are based on geography in the state of Massachusetts. So the website that Dan had shared with us or even calling the referral hotline or the contact number, um, you can find out the location of your local site office. Thank you both again for joining us. I felt like we get a lot from this podcast. As always, is there any other information that you wanted to share or contact information? If you want contact um, information for the Southeast Recovery Learning Community that Dan talked about, you can find them at www.southeastrlc.org, and you might find that useful. And thank you again for having me. Thank you. Great. So for further information about our podcast or to listen to our podcast, you can go to WARARadio.com. You can also email us at mentalillness at WARARadio.com. Our podcast, Exploring Mental Illness, airs Mondays at, from 6 to 7 p.m. here at 1320 a.m. radio. And you can also find us on Facebook at, at Exploring Mental Illness if you go on Facebook. In addition to that, we have uh, some awesome resources that are available through our monthly drop-in center in the Attleboro area. Uh, it's called the You Are Not Alone Drop-In Center. And we also have a Facebook page, and you can contact us through that at, at Attleboro Recovery. Um, Fuller Hospital, for anybody who's interested in services about Fuller, we have a new website uh, dedicated to our hospital. It is fullerhospital.com, or you can contact us directly at 833-3-FULLER um, or 833-338-5537. And uh, if you would like to speak to me, Carrie Ballou, Community Relations specifically, I'm at extension 2354. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Daniel and Dale for coming in. Uh, I feel like I've known you guys forever, uh, which is which is very comforting. Uh, I want to thank Carrie and especially Austin for, um, for filling in for me last time. You can hear us, once again, WARRadio.com, Monday at 6 o'clock. We're also on Stitcher, uh, Google Play, iTunes, and um, TuneIn. So if you, um, you want to go and, and find us there, we, we can hook you up right there. In conclusion, just want to, uh, you know, tell everybody out there, you know, you are not alone is not a tagline. It's not a gimmick. It's, it's something that is true. 
which I learned firsthand. Um, I'm going to take a couple of quotes to, to end this podcast um, from Dan. Um, Resiliency is the hallmark of recovery and nothing succeeds like success. I think that those are two great quotes to live by. And always, if you don't feel right, if you know somebody who you feel is acting weird, don't be afraid. You can always call 911. They're not going to get mad. That's what they're there for. And they will point you in the right direction. So for Exploring Mental Illness, I'm, I'm Derek Molhan. And um, take care of yourselves um, and each other. Uh, be well until we hear from you again. Bye-bye. The contents of the Exploring Mental Illness podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health, and related subjects. The content provided in this podcast, its associated website, and any linked material are not intended and should not be construed as medical advice. This podcast should not be used in any legal capacity. No guarantee is given regarding the accuracy of any statements or opinions made on this podcast or its associated website. If the listener or any other person has a medical concern, they should consult an appropriately licensed healthcare professional. The views expressed on this podcast do not represent the views or opinions of Attleboro Access Cable Systems, Arbor Fuller Hospital, or their parents' corporations. The contents of the Exploring Mental Illness podcast and its associated website are copyrighted Attleboro Access Cable Systems. The podcast may be redistributed in accordance with Creative Commons License 4.0.